All right, so the vestibular system is a set of structures that are found inside the inner ear, meaning they're right next to the cochlea. So remember we had the cochlea before is that kind of spiral looking, snail shell looking structure. Right next to that are some, some loops, some little semicircle looking loops and a couple other things. And th those together make up the vestibular system. They are within them, they, they have sensory receptors that among other things help contribute to our sense of balance. Sometimes we call our sense of balance equilibrioception. Um, but kind of the vestibular system helps us do things like stand upright, but also provides information for a lot of other important things, as we'll see. Specifically, the, the sensory receptors in the vestibular system, they give us two important sources of information. So first, they detect changes in angular rotation, meaning tilt or spin, like when a ballerina spins in circles, or when you lean forward, or when a boat we're on suddenly rolls to one side. Sometimes we call these, these different uh, orientations of, of spin or rotation, yaw, pitch, and roll for spinning around versus tilting forward, backward versus kind of tilting your head sideways where your ears go towards your shoulders. Those are kind of the three different um, uh, planes in which you can kind of rotate your head and all of those get tracked. They're all a form of angular rotation. The vestibular system gives info on that. And then additionally, we've got different sensory receptors in there that detect changes in linear acceleration. So acceleration in a straight line, which would include acceleration due to gravity, but also just like a car starting to move forward or something like that. Now, functionally, the biggest role of vestibular system is, is really to help us stay balanced as we stand, as we walk, as we run, but it also helps us tell up from down and helps us feel changes in movement. Like if someone pushes you off your balance or if the car you're in starts speeding up suddenly or if the plane you're flying in suddenly drops 300 feet in really bad turbulence, we feel that, right? We perceive it. That's thanks to the neurons in the vestibular system detecting those movement changes and firing a signal to the brain. Another important function of the vestibular system is to keep our visual images steady, despite the fact that our heads move around all day long, whether from spinning your head to look off to your right side or the slight bouncing while you move and walk and things like that, or keeping your visual world from feeling all messed up when you're nodding or shaking your head no. And of course, to keep your eye on the ball during sports, right? When your body and thus your head might be moving quite a bit, but you want to visually fixate on the ball to be able to keep track of where it is. So this function of keeping the visual image steady, it's totally automatic and unconscious. It's a reflex. It's called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. An ocular just means something dealing with your eyes. So vestibular system, meeting the ocular, the eye system reflex. So the vestibulo-ocular reflex, it automatically makes your eyes move in the opposite direction of head movement in order to compensate for that head movement as your head moves around. So for example, if your head is spinning to the left, right? So you got your head rotating a certain way, like rotating to the left, it's gonna excite or, or turn on this little detector which is you know, an afferent pathway, afferent with an A, coming from your vestibular system. In this case, because it's a reflex, it doesn't even have to go deep into the brain for processing. That signal can hook directly up to some motor neurons shown in, in red here on the left, which control your eye muscles. So what it does is it inhibits the eye muscles on one side and excites the eye muscles on the other side of each eye, rotating those eyes then in the appropriate manner to, to go compensate for the, the head movement, kind of opposite of the head rotation. Now, here's a big important detail for the vestibular system. It, whether for rotation or for linear acceleration, doesn't matter, it only responds to starts or stops or speed ups or slow downs of motion, not to a constant rate of motion. In other words, it only detects changes in these movement, right? So for those who know a little physics, we, we might say it doesn't detect velocity, it detects acceleration, the change in velocity. So that means your vestibular system cannot tell the difference between sitting in a car that's not moving and sitting in a car that's going at a super steady 50 miles an hour, or even in a car that's going a very steady 200 miles an hour, or even in a space car that's going 2 million miles an hour, it can't 
tell the difference. Your vestibular system will not tell any difference. As long as those speeds are steady and unchanging, your vestibular system won't be firing any neurons, won't be sending a signal to the brain about movement. It'll all feel the same. And if your eyes are closed and you've got noise canceling headphones on, really the only way you'd be able to sense the car going 200 miles an hour versus sitting still would be through like the car's vibration, right? Activating your touch receptors. Another way to think of it would be, imagine you're in an elevator. Obviously in an elevator, you can feel it move, right? And yeah, that's true. As long as the speed is changing, your vestibular system will help you feel the move of the elevator. So when it first starts moving, you'll definitely feel it. As it speeds up, right, gets its speed going, you'll feel that. When it approaches the floor, it's going to stop at. You'll certainly feel it slow down and you'll feel it once it stops moving. But if it's a really long elevator, like for a building with a hundred stories or more, for example, then the elevator will reach a, a pretty smooth, constant speed for a while. And at that point, if your eyes are closed or, you know, if, if it's a, you know, there's nothing to see, if it doesn't have a window or anything like that, you will have no way to feel how fast it's moving and, and whether it's moving up versus moving down, no difference to your vestibular system, no way for you to detect that aside from your, you know, your knowledge that you pressed the up button. So a steady 10 miles per hour going up feels the same to your vestibular system as a steady 15 miles per hour going down, which feels the same as a steady five miles per hour going down, which all feel the same as not moving at all. But if the speed is changing, right, if it's accelerating or decelerating, then we clearly feel it. And that's thanks to the vestibular system. This fact actually, that our vestibular system only detects changes can lead to an interesting illusion that you may have felt before but not had a word for. It's called vection. Vection is an illusory feeling of movement when you're not actually moving. Like if you've ever been sitting in a, a train next to another train, for example, or in a big airplane after boarding but before it pulls out of the gate, and maybe your plane is right next to another big plane, what might happen is if the other plane starts to move, maybe the other plane starts to back out of the gate while your plane is not moving, then think about what happens for your various sensory systems. Visually, right? Visually out of your peripheral vision, you might see the movement happening where the other plane is going backward relative to your plane. But of course, that is visually the exact same input, the exact same thing you would see if your plane was moving forward and the other one was sitting still. It would still visually have the other one going backward relative to you or you forward relative to the other one. So why does it feel like I'm moving when I'm not? Why does that sometimes create the illusory feeling of motion that when you're not actually moving anywhere? because the vestibular system d isn't actually a, a speedometer. It doesn't actually track real velocity. It only tracks changes. So the vestibular system never actually fires for constant movement, whether it's sitting still or moving forward at a constant speed. Both of those feel the exact same to the vestibular system. Both of them have neurons firing in the vestibular system the exact same way. So my brain is used to the fact, used to moving at a constant speed without getting any vestibular activation. Happens all the time if you're going at a constant speed that's not changing. So here in this situation where with the, the train moving back next to you or the other plane moving back next to you, your brain is faced with two possibilities, both of which would activate your visual and your vestibular receptors in exactly the same way. Possibility one, you're sitting still and the other plane is moving. Possibility two, you're moving at a constant speed relative to the other plane. Both of those would activate every one of your sensory systems identically. So the brain has to guess at one reality or the other without having evidence supporting either one directly. Often that means the brain will end up perceiving some movement, right? Constructing a perception of movement despite the fact we're actually sitting still. So, okay. What are the sensory receptors for our vestibular system? What are the things that actually detect this change and, and turn on neurons firing? They actually transduce the neural signal, right? There are two different sets of receptors. One for the angular acceleration we talked about, like spinning and rotating, things at, at angles. And one other set for linear acceleration, like going straight up, straight down, straight forward, straight backwards, straight side to side. 
both sets of receptors, they're in these little fluid filled areas in the inner ear, little structures in the inner ear that are filled with fluid, similar to how the cochlea was fluid filled, right? That fluid filled spiral in the middle ear, the cochlea, that was filled with fluid. Same with these neighboring structures that make up the vestibular system right nearby. So when we saw a, a diagram of the cochlea before, right? Well, I, I told you just kind of ignore those extra little structures there. We'll come back to them. Well, this is us coming back to them. This is the vestibular system. So specifically, the two parts of the vestibular system, the two sets of structures, one, there's the semicircular canals. These are the, the parts you see here that are these kind of big loops, right? They're, they're canals because they're filled with, with fluid, with liquid, and they're semicircular. So it makes sense where they got their names. And they are for detecting the changes in rotation and tilt and spin. In other words, angular acceleration. There are three of these. And anatomically, they're set up so they're all at different orientations orthogonal to each other. So like one of these semicircles is oriented kind of horizontally, like a hula hoop would be oriented around your body. So flat relative to the ground and picking up spin kind of around around in the same way a, a hula hoop would. But another semicircle is oriented in like a, the front to back plane, so to speak, to pick up the kind of rotation you get from nodding your head forward or backward. And then the third is oriented to pick up tilting your head to the side, like that confused dog look, or like if you tilt your ear towards your shoulder. So those three together are the, the semicircular canals. There are three of them. That's one set of detectors. So, so in there will be one set of neurons, one set of detectors for the vestibular system. But then there's also this other area, this other structure uh, called the otolith organs. So they're the, the organs themselves are called the utricle and saccule. Don't worry about it. You don't need to, to know that or memorize that or anything. But there are these two little organs inside this more middle lump here. Those together are called the otolith organs. Those are ones that have neurons that fire for linear acceleration, which will include gravity. So the whole straight up and down, side to side, or front to back kind of acceleration, no spinning involved. So when I say these structures have sensory neurons in them, the neurons are actually just hair cells, just like we had inside the cochlea on that basilar membrane. So we've got little hair cells inside the semicircular canals and inside the otolith organs, same thing, some more hair cells. And what makes those cells fire, because I'm talking about neurons, right? They're sensory neurons. What makes them fire? Well, just like in the cochlea, they're fluid filled structures and it's basically a sloshing of that fluid that'll bend the hair cells. And by bending them, we'll open up their ion channels and make them fire a neural signal to the brain. Very similar to the cochlea, the other part that's in the inner ear. So it's the same setup as the hair cells in the cochlea where they've got little tip links connecting those little cilia hairs sticking out of them. So sloshing in the correct direction will stretch those. Again, it has to go in the correct direction, but if it's going in the correct direction, it's gonna stretch those little tip links, gonna pull those ion channels open, that depolarizes the neuron. Remember, that's what we need to do to make a neuron fire. Normally they're polarized, they're super negative. This is going to depolarize it, make it less negative inside by flooding in a bunch of positive ions, a bunch of plus signs, which will make it fire more action potentials. So it excites the neuron, makes it fire at a higher rate than its normal baseline rate when it's just resting, right? If it sloshes in the opposite direction, the wrong direction, then of course that's gonna keep the ion channels closed and might actually make it harder to fire, might actually inhibit the firing even below baseline potentially. So don't worry too much about the specifics, but just to give you a, a feel for how that might work from a physics perspective, think about inertia, the way objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by another force. So like when a car is going fast and then it suddenly breaks or slams into something, the person inside the car keeps some of that momentum for a bit, right? They keep moving forward a little extra relative to the car due to that inertia because they're in motion, they're gonna stay in motion. And then that's only stopped by wearing a seatbelt that holds them in. That's why it's so important to wear a seatbelt or you'll shoot forward through the windshield. Uh, that would be inertia. Or if you're on a speedboat, let's say it's going fast in a big circle, you're getting kind of as it goes in that circle, you're getting kind of pulled outward, pulled out as if you're gonna fall, shoot out of the boat, right? And then suddenly if the boat stops circling and straightens out, your body will keep going a bit to the side for a moment because relative to the boat, your inertia is still rotating that in that, that big circle. So similar kind of idea here. 
Inside the semicircular canal, the fluid is just sitting still prior to any movement. If you're sitting still, the fluid's just in those canals sitting still. But then let's say you suddenly spin your head to the left. So you suddenly turn your head, you spin it to the left to, to look at something off to your left that just happened. Okay? As the head spins left, the liquid inside is going to initially stay in place due to inertia. So whatever liquid was here is going to stay in place as the structure moves around it in the opposite direction, right? So as the structure moves in the direction of the head moving, the liquid will, relative to that, be moving in the opposite direction, pushing those hair cells down. So that'll, that'll activate those hair cells. It'll push them open, tip links, right? We'll pull them open, make the neurons fire so your brain can get a signal that says, hey, the head just tilted this much to the left. And in the other side, in the other canal on the, on the right side, right, the canal in the other ear, the opposite happens. So that one may have a decrease in firing. The other one has an increase in firing, which is always what happens when your head spins left. So that pattern of firing, based on the inertia of that liquid in there, that's a consistent indicator of your head spinning left. And then, of course, if the other direction happened, if the opposite happened in both of those, then that would be an indicator of your head spinning right, and so on. So, like I said, there's a, there's a semicircular canal in three different orientations here. So there's one for what we might call pitch, like pitching. Uh, you know, it's like going forward and back, one for roll and one for yaw. Those are kind of just the terms for the three angles. In other words, the three axes your head can spin or, or be spun by something where it's, uh, you know, your head spinning, uh, you know, nodding uh, forward, backward, your head tilting toward your ears, toward your shoulders, and then, of course, spinning around like a ballerina. All right. Then there's the, so that was the semicircular canals for those three types of rotation. Then there's the otolith organs. They have a slightly different setup, but we're still dealing with a fluid-filled structure and some hair cells that'll open if they're pulled in the correct direction. So same basic setup. In this case, though, the, the organs where the hair cells are basically have a bunch of little dust or particles, you could say, kind of hooked onto a membrane up against it. So if you accelerate in a given direction, let's say your body just starts moving forward very fast or something like that, the membrane will be pulled, right? The, the membrane that gets like pulled by inertia then will move the and, and kind of move against the base of the hair cells there and bend their, their tips. So it opens their ion channels to make them fire. So acceleration, whether it's to you know the car moving forward all of a sudden or even just tilting your head so that gravity starts pulling that membrane downward, that'll bend those hair cells and send a signal to the brain from the otolith organs. Now, functionally, the vestibular system can cause some interesting effects. So for example, if it's having issues, we'll experience dizziness, motion sickness, or vertigo. Uh, vertigo is where some people feel like the environment is moving, like the ground is moving or spinning under your feet. But I'm sure you know we can also feel dizziness or vertigo type perception when we're intoxicated by alcohol or, or other poisons or some medications. And that's because those can affect your vestibular system indirectly. For example, drinking enough alcohol, it actually changes the, the volume and the composition of that fluid inside your vestibular structures, which means those neurons, those little hair cells inside, will fire inaccurately relative to your actual head movement. Now, of course, alcohol also depresses the functioning of the cerebellum, that structure at the bottom and back of your brain that I mentioned was important for automatic motor coordination, so that doesn't help any either. But this is also why that feeling of dizziness often happens around the time you might want to vomit. That's your body recognizing it's got poison in the system and trying to expel the poison. Now, how is the vestibular system involved in, in motion sickness? Like when uh, turbulence in an airplane or the, the rocking of a big boat makes you feel sick? Well, think of it this way. The turbulence or the boat rocking from the waves is causing some pretty intense vestibular system activation. There's no doubt about that. But if the plane's windows are closed or maybe just show some random sky or clouds out there, right? Or if you're in a room inside the boat below deck, then you don't have any visual input about the movement. Visually, the inside of the plane looks static and unchanging. There's no movement there. The visual system says there's no movement going on. Visually, the inside of the boat looks static and unchanging during that rocking. So when does your body usually experience vestibular activity, feeling like motion and spinning is happening from the vestibular system, but without visual input of actual motion or spinning, well, 
happens when you're drunk or otherwise poisoned. So basically, motion sickness from a boat or turbulence of an airplane or something like that is your body kicking into gear that reflex to vomit out poison. You feel nausea or what we call motion sickness because your brain doesn't know the real situation. It only knows what its sensory receptors are telling it through the pew, 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 pew of neurons firing. And in this case, the neural activity is really similar to when you're drunk or poisoned. Now, finally, there is a, a very common condition I wanted to mention, one that causes 20% or so of all dizziness symptoms that people experience. And for older people, it causes 50% of all dizziness symptoms. It's called BPPV, which stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Don't worry about what it stands for, but BPPV, this is a, a really common condition for, for dizziness. Basically, if you have this, anytime you move your head, even a little bit, it can cause this intense dizziness and vertigo. It's really disorienting and really can make you feel horrible. Uh, it can happen to anyone. It actually happened to a friend of mine in graduate school. She had a really rough half of a semester before finally getting it diagnosed and fixed. Basically, what happens is the, the dust, those little particles I talked about from the membrane of the otolith organs, if some of it gets dislodged, it can get stuck in a nearby semicircular canal, which means even just a little bit of head movement sloshes that little bit of dust around in the semicircular canal, which falsely activates a bunch of the hair cells in there that detect spinning. So the brain perceives spinning from even the tiniest bit of head movement, which is not fun. Yuck. Now, the treatment for BPPV is actually pretty simple. It can be done by a trained medical professional, so don't try this at home. But basically what they'll do is kind of just spin, spin your head along the different axes of rotation for those different semicircular canals. And they'll repeat that until the spinning dislodges those particles, gets them back out of the canal. After that, symptoms usually improve a ton. Now, by the way, understanding the vestibular system, and especially that, that fact that it only responds to changes in acceleration, not to, not to true speed, but to changes in speed, is really important for, for some circumstances, like your airline pilot keeping the plane you're in from crashing. So pilots actually require very extensive training to learn to ignore their senses, to ignore their vestibular system, because there are really common vestibular illusions that you can't avoid that can easily cause a plane crash if they listen to their perception rather than the actual mechanical instruments. So for example, uh, let's say a, a pilot is flying a little plane and for some reason their plane starts spinning a little to the left. So it's got this leftward spin like you can see here. The, the pilots then, of course, when it starts spinning left, the pilot is going to perceive a left spin. That's accurate, right? Thanks to their vestibular system. But if that spin continues, especially if the spin continues at about the same rate, then the pilot will stop perceiving spin or it'll seem very a lot lessened, right? Because there's no change. So the vestibular system will stop detecting any spin. The feeling of rotation goes away even while the plane is still spinning. Now imagine what could happen. Imagine the pilot, there was a left spin for a, you know, that started up, right? And then the pilot corrects the left spin back to not spinning. They collect, they, they correct the plane to where it's going straight again. But that means the change in their vestibular system is to the right of where it just was. So they'll perceive a right spin now. Even though they only corrected the left spin, they're actually going straight and they aren't spinning anymore. It'll feel like they're in a right spin. So they're going straight, but it, feels like they're in a right spin, that's the illusion. And since they perceive that right spin, what are they gonna do? They're gonna try to correct it by adding back some left spin, which might make their perception go back to feeling like they're straight again, but now they're back where they started in a spin, but now in a spin that feels like they're going straight. And especially if they don't have any visual information, like if it's nighttime or if there are a bunch of clouds around, then it's very easy to have either no feel at all or rather entirely the wrong feel for which way the plane is going. And a lot of pilots have crashed planes from this and it happened a lot until the training got better at ensuring pilots trust their instruments over their own perception because those illusions are possible due to the way the vestibular system is set up to only detect change in speed, right? Accelerations in rotation or, or linear acceleration. So, okay, now with the previous sensory systems, after we learn the sensory receptors, what did we usually learn? We learned the pathway going up to the brain. And thankfully, 
For proprioception and the vestibular system, it's pretty damn straightforward. They are body senses. It's somatosensory info. So they just send their information the same way as before, contralaterally. It goes to the opposite hemisphere of the brain and it goes through the brain stem, then up through the thalamus and ends up at the primary somatosensory cortex, S1. Now, just a side note, there are other projections, like other places the info gets sent. Not all of the signal, but like some subset, some minor subset of the signals do go off to other places. So for example, info that comes in from the vestibular system also has some axons that project to the cerebellum and directly to the spinal cord to help with like automated unconscious coordination of head and eye movement, like reflexes and the like. But most of our sensory systems have these bonus projections, like some additional side pathways that a minority of the signals get sent to. But for our purposes, we'll concentrate on the main pathway, which here is the same as for touch and for pain and other somatosensory stuff. It goes to S1, the primary somatosensory cortex up in the parietal lobe, and there all the bodily info gets integrated and processed together. So S1, plus surrounding brain areas, other parts of the parietal and so on, they're going to integrate all this touch and pain and temperature and interoceptive and body and limb position and balance and movement information into a kind of unified holistic body representation that is going to be located within the three-dimensional spatial world that is represented or constructed by the parietal lobe's spatial processing. It's what gives us that sense of, here's my body, here's its shape, here's where my limbs are right now, here's how I relate to that space around me, here is where I'm feeling that touch that's happening to my hand right now. Uh, think of it this way, close your eyes, like close your eyes, stick your right arm straight out in front of you. Now while it's held out there in front of you, imagine someone touched the back of your hand. Where in space did that touch on the back of your hand happen? Well, in front of you, of course, right? Because that's where your hand is right now. Now, keep your eyes closed, and this time, raise your arm way up above your head and hold your arm up there. Don't bring it down. Imagine someone now touches the back of your hand. That means the same Merkel discs will go off as before, the same touch system. Nothing is different to the touch system here. But thanks to proprioception, you know your hand is currently up above you, not in front of you. So where in space do you localize that touch is happening? Where do you perceive in space that touch is happening to the back of your hand? Why? It's going to be above you, not in front of you. So you perceive a spatial component, a spatial location in 3D space for that touch. Even though the mechanoreceptors, the Merkel discs and Meissner corpuscles and all that, they have no difference in their activity. The parietal lobe is combining information across those different bodily senses. So not only can we track things in terms of purely body-centered coordinates, like the touch was on the back of my hand because these specific Merkel discs fired, but also in spatial coordinates, like the touch was off to my left because proprioception tells me that's where my hand is right now and I felt the touch on my hand. That requires combining info from two senses, but that's what allows us to orient ourselves, locate ourselves in our body within space, which is important so we can you know, pick things up that we see, right? So now that we've met the vestibular system and the proprioception system, we can understand a little more about balance. Balance is not really an individual sensory system itself the way vision is, right? Vision processes signals from the eyes, smell processes chemicals in the nose. Balance is not just vestibular signals. So you might think, oh yeah, the vestibular system, it's kind of the balance system, but that's oversimplified. Balance is not just vestibular signals because our balance is also helped by info coming in from proprioception about our body posture, where our limbs are and stuff like that. But even info coming in from vision, like obviously, right? You can see the world changing when you start tipping over, right? Or when you suddenly start moving and get optic flow in your visual field. So balance is actually a perceptual experience and a, and a function that comes from combining info from these three sensory systems, vestibular and proprioceptive and visual. So you can experience this. We're gonna do a demo called Romberg's test. You can experience this directly by doing a, we'll do a simple version of, of a test that neurologists or neuropsychologists will do to help diagnose issues in those, those systems we talked about 
when someone's having balance problems. Now, anything involving balance can, can have a little danger to it if you fall over. So if you want to do this demo, do this one at your own risk. And I suggest maybe finding a friend or a partner to spot you while you do it, or at the very least stand near a chair or something that, that you can catch on to if you start slipping. So for this demo, first just stand up and balance on one leg, assuming you can do so comfortably. Most people can do this for a little while, right? So you can kind of even feel out like, how long can I stand on one leg and see how well you can do? And of course, don't worry, it's common to lose your balance after a few moments and have to start over. But for most people, that's the easy version. Most people with your eyes open can, can sit there and kind of balance for a little while on one leg. You have at that point visual and proprioceptive and vestibular information helping you balance on that leg. Now for the hard version, what I'll have you do if you want to try this out again, maybe do it with a spotter or at the very least by a chair or something you can grab onto if you start falling and open your eyes if you start falling. But for the hard version, you would close your eyes for this. So close your eyes and then see how long you can stay balanced on one leg doing that same thing. Again, be careful here. Don't, I don't want anyone to fall. But the idea is to see if you can balance when one of those three senses is removed. Okay, so if you want, you can pause and try these out. Now, most people can still do with this hard version. Most people can still do this. Most people can still, for at least a little bit, balance on one leg with their eyes closed. Although, the longer you go within, without integrating that visual feedback, the harder it gets. The easier it is to start slipping, start going to one side. So it is hard to do this for very long, but you can do it for at least a little while. And certainly you're going to become much more aware of your vestibular and your proprioceptive systems if you try it. Now, this is usually done as an actual neurological exam to diagnose possible issues with the proprioceptive or vestibular sensory systems to find possible deficits to those. It's called Romberg's test. Basically, let's say someone's having some coordination problems, right? So in their, their movement and their motor activities, they're having some issues with coordination, issues with balance, that sort of thing. This test can help distinguish between whether the, the problem is coming from their sensory systems, like a sensory deficit to one of those two systems, proprioception of the vestibular system, versus maybe they're actually just having some motor problems, like some cerebellum issues or something like that. One of the parts of the brain that coordinates the, the motor system together, maybe that's the issue. This is a way to diagnose it for a medical professional or a neuropsychologist. So it turns out to maintain balance while, while just standing up, to maintain our balance generally, generally requires two of those three sensory systems I've talked about proprioception, vestibular system, and vision. If you take one of those away, we can still do it, but we need at least two other sources. So like when we did the easy version, great, we've got all three, no problem. When we did the hard version, you still had two of those, so most people are able to balance for a little while. But if someone is having an issue with, say, their proprioception system, then when they get to that part of the test with their eyes closed, all they've got to go on now would be the vestibular information, one sense, and that's not enough to maintain balance, so they fall almost immediately. So if you suspect proprioceptive, proprioceptive or vestibular impairment, basically just comparing their standing balance with their eyes open versus their eyes closed is a really quick and easy test to, to narrow down the possibilities there. Now, I'll end this video with a short clip that, that shows some equipment used by psychologists, by, by researchers and modern research on these sensory systems that we've been talking about. So let me play this video. So there are basically two main objects concerning the rotating chair. So one is a neuroscientific question and how is the balance system represented in the brain. So this is information about rotation, acceleration um, and, and my position with respect to gravity. So this is one neuroscience question. It's a tricky question because it's a tricky sensory system. It has been forgotten. There's the famous five senses of Aristotle, it's the sixth sense, so to speak, the vestibular system was not part of it, the balance system. So we just want to figure out how and where in the brain this is, is represented. And how is the self, the subject of experience, related to this balance representation. This chair allows us to do a systematic and selective activation of the vestibular system. So this is 
um, a detection system in the inner ear. It's not hearing, it's the balance and acceleration. So if I turn my head this way, this activates the vestibular system. It tells my brain my head is moving, my body is moving. And this allows us to give very systematic machine control stimulation of this, of this vestibular system. And clinical research, past previous research from, from my group has shown that this vestibular or balance input is important for the self basically telling or giving the brain a reference frame where the self is, uh, is localized in space. We're looking in the brain where patterns of activations can be found. We call this the balance cortex, where is it localized in the brain. Now what we also want to achieve is if this information of bodily rotation does not match with the visual information that should be congruent, then all sorts of illusion can happen. A very familiar illusion would be you're sitting in a train, you're reading your paper, and there's another train on the tracks right ne next to you. Now that train will be moving, but this can induce the sensation of illusory vection or movement in the opposite direction. So although the train next to me is moving this way, I have the impression, whatever this eye of conscious experience is, to move in that direction. So there is an effect on the self of the subject of experience, of all conscious experience, that seems to be moving this way, although just the visual field is moving. So what we are manipulating very systematically is how this visual input integrates with my bodily input. So this guy is actually a, a well-known researcher who studies the somatosensory systems and bodily illusions and is interested in how they contribute to our, our bodily sense of self, as he talked about. We, we will run into him in the next big topic in this course after somatosensation, when one of the things we'll discuss is uh, out-of-body experiences, the perception of feeling like you're outside of your body. For now, though, that's enough about proprioception and, and about the vestibular system. Before we finish this topic and, and move into the next big topic, before we move on from kind of our combined somatosensory topics, I wanted to do one last video, a little video on something we call sensory adaptation. And I'll, I'll try and relate that stuff back to, to what we just learned here.